Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the chance to catch up and chat with amazing humans. For this episode, I'm so happy to be joined by a very good friend of mine, Stu Coleman. Welcome to the conversation, Stu. Hey, Matt, how you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you, for this 11th episode. I was going to say, your your energy energy levels are good, so uh, keep going. Good, and the sound level is not too bad either. Um, so, so as I will always do, just very briefly, I'll introduce you as I know him, but I'll ask you to do your proper introduction to, to the people that are listening, um, and then we'll get into the conversation around uh, mental health, as all of these are. This is part of the Pod-a-thon series, um, so this is episode 11, um, and uh, it's just great to get so many people representing so many different perspectives, and that's what this is all about. So Stu and I have known each other for... I, I don't even know really probably seven or eight years maybe maybe a bit longer even who knows um but we we originally met at a running club and then it sort of carried on and we kept in touch and uh, actually Stu was a really good mentor to me when I was starting my business so I always talk about Stu's role in sort of helping me to find my pathway so thank you for that Stu I'll say that up front now and and so we've stayed in touch we have breakfast together every now and again every couple of months or so and when when we're permitted to of course and uh, and it's just great to catch up and talk about stuff and we talk about boys stuff and loads of different things going on in our worlds and and it's just nice to have a mate you can chat to and we do talk openly about mental health the conversation and so on so I'm so happy that you said you would join me uh, Stu for this conversation so welcome you can do your proper introduction who you are and and what you're doing. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, really appreciate being here. Um, I think it's a great thing that you're doing. Love to be part of it. Um, and looking forward to a, a sausage bat soon. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I'm Stu Coleman. Um, I'm in my mid-40s. Um, I have three kids and a stepson as well, so four teenagers in the house, which is always great fun. Um, but I think the thing that I want to talk about today, the thing I want to kind of share with you all is I do live with, obviously my wife, I do live with my wife, that's a good thing. Uh, but my wife does live with a long-term illness. She's got MS. Um, and she's amazing. Um, her energy, her spirit, her dedication to um, fighting uh, this illness and this disease that she's got is a wonderful thing to watch, albeit the disease itself is horrible. Her energy and spirit is an inspiration to me every day and absolutely brilliant. Um, but I wanted to talk today, if I can, about um, the other side of it, which is what it's like to live with someone that has a long term illness and what it's like uh, to deal with some of the kind of the mental health battles that go along with um, having to see her have to deal with what she's going through and some of the feelings that you feel as a, an individual kind of coping with, with um, life and the things it throws you as a result of that kind of long-term illness. So that's kind of what I want to get into today. Um, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I knew, I knew what you wanted to talk about, and this is such a big subject and one that we've talked about on a number of occasions, of course, when we've been, we're having our you know, sausage baps. I love that. And uh, our buckets of coffee normally, but um, let's get into that. Yeah, let's get into that because carers roles are really important in all of this. And that's something that we, we often don't always get to talk about, you know, we tend to talk about the individual and what they're going through and how they're going through it, but you do have that unique perspective, like, you know, you know, from your, from your side, of course, but many people do that today as well, right? So let's talk about how you, you know, how you want to talk about it. You you define that, Stu. I'm not going to tell you what to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, obviously ahead of time, I was thinking about um, what I want to talk about and kind of things I wanted to cover. Um, I think there's probably three things that I want to kind of highlight in my life that that have an impact from a mental health point of view that, that are related to to kind of the caring thing. I think. Yeah. Um, it's going to sound an odd thing to say that I live in a house of six people, um, but loneliness is something that I think is mm. is um, part of living with someone with a long term illness. Um, so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the guilt um, yeah. of living with it. Um, I think that's a really important part. Um, and I want to talk about the frustration and the um, anger, I think is probably the best word, um, and how that kind of plays with your mind and, and messes with you. But let's start with the... Um, uh, with the kind of loneliness and like I say it's an odd thing to say and it's a thing that I've taken a long time to kind of understand um, to get my head around why I feel the way I feel sometimes and I wanted to really start actually by saying obviously I'm talking about me and my feelings today I, uh, my wife is yeah. amazing um, the word carer is a word that we struggle with uh, because she's staunchly independent she does everything for herself um, I'm there to, to support her and help her, but I definitely don't care for her if anything she cares for me. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, loneliness, is, let's say it's an odd one. It's one. It's a feeling I didn't ever think I'd feel. Um, mm. And it's certainly not one that I thought would manifest, like I say, in a, in a, in a busy house, you know, dog, two cats and, and lots of kids. Um, where I kind of got to with it is um, when you live with someone that has a long-term illness, um, they have to focus quite often on 
um, living with and dealing with that illness. And how that kind of plays out from a, um, a kind of psyche point of view is um, this feeling of it's kind of all on me. Um, you know, I'm responsible for having to make sure that the lights stay on and everything ticks over and that everything is is um, as it's meant to be as a family. Mm. Um, I'm responsible for you know um, making sure that she needs, she has what she needs and that her life is structured in a way where she can fight this this illness that she's got and she can live in a world where um, she's able to do the things that she needs to do. And that sense of it all being on me, that kind of pressure, that kind of um, uh, responsibility, I guess, is, is the key word, yeah. um, is a really lonely place to be. You know, you, you, you're constantly looking at yourself, you're constantly looking in on yourself and saying, am I doing enough? Am I providing enough? Am I supporting enough? Um, and it, you know, it, it gets, frankly, it gets quite dark sometimes, you know, mm. you, you can feel really kind of isolated, again, which is a really strange place. It's you know, a room full of people and you can really feel kind of alone within that. Um, and that's taken a lot of time to understand. It's taken an even longer amount of time to kind of um, to kind of deal with. Um, and actually, one thing I would say within that thing that um, I'd like to try and to, to, to influence and fix for down the line is particularly with MS, people who live with people who live with MS. If that makes sense. Um, there really is a lack of kind of support groups. There's loads out there. If you've got MS, there's loads of support groups. There's loads of people that you can talk to and people have to understand. Um, and generically for carers, there's loads and loads of support groups and, and, and um, opportunities to speak out there. But there's very few, if any, that I've found that speak to the specifics of living with someone with MS. And I don't want to kind of call it out as something special. It's just, right. it's, it's life. We, we live and deal with it. But it's, there's definite um, characteristics or things about living with someone with MS that, that it would be hugely beneficial, I think, to kind of speak to and understand and help with that loneliness. So I think that's, that's from a journey point of view, I think that's something that I think I need to go further on that journey to really understand yeah. how I can start to help others and help myself by being able to open up about it more and, and deal with some of that um, weird loneliness, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. Um, yeah. Um, I think the second thing that, that I kind of wanted to focus on um, was guilt mm. um and this is probably the one i've struggled with the most um because it manifests against all the feelings you have as a um uh someone that lives with someone who has ms that's a really bad saying i need to get a better way of saying that but um the guilt really kind of um, sits and rides across it all because every time you have a, a thought about how difficult it is how challenging life is for you and you know, for me um, how annoyed you are at a situation, how frustrating it is that you know, your wife can't do something or your partner can't do something, so you've got to go and do it for them because they're tired or, or whatever. Um, you know, all, those, all those kind of feelings of, of um, various feelings in kind of those situations all kind of boils back to, and then you feel guilty because you're not the one living with the illness. And I'm sure that's probably something that um, is, well, I know it's something that's not unique to, to people with MS or, or partners with people with MS, but it's, again, it's a really hard thing to kind of grasp because, um, you know, on many occasions, uh, the way I, I try and deal with when I'm feeling tough or feeling down and, and things are tough is, is I go for walks and I daydream. I, you know, I self-meditate by taking myself off to some world and just wander around walking the dog and thinking about nothing in yeah. particular, but something that I can just kind of, you know, just kind of a, a thought that goes through my mind is I kind of daydream. Um, but I can start thinking about these situations and start thinking about what's going on and the guilt just kind of bubbles to the top it's like Stu talk to me. what are you doing shut up you can't you can't think oh, sh oh that's really tough or that's really difficult or um you know oh woe is me because your wife's got MS and it's much much harder you know I see her fighting against uh, her inability to walk or I see her struggling with her balance or her tiredness and all these things it's like you can't yeah. feel bad about your situation because it's 10 times worse for her um and that's you know, that that guilt can really um, pull you down. It can really kind of tug at, at who you are, and it can make you feel. Um, I'm just trying to think the right way way of putting it, but it can make you feel quite um, uh, work not worthless. That's the wrong kind of word, I think. But mm -hmm. it can make you feel that that your feelings don't matter so much, or that you're wrong to have those feelings. That's the that's the phrase I'm looking for. Okay. Um, and again, that can be quite a difficult thing to to kind of get your head around. Um, and understand um, 
And then the third thing, and I'm going to come to kind of how I how I try and deal with this as we go through. But I think the third thing that that really kind of manifests itself is is the anger. Um, and there's t- kind of two parts to that anger, I guess. The first one is anger at, at um, the situation, anger at having to deal with this. You know, when I met my wife, she she uh, she had MS, but it was it was um, very much in the background. It didn't affect us day to day. It's only really come on the last kind of six years or so. Yeah. And sometimes I do get angry at, at the fact that we have to deal with this, the fact that she has to deal with it and she has to live with this, the fact that it does affect her life in such a significant way. Um you know, and that anger kind of uh, the, the illness or the disease is is present, and it's it's um, it's not constant, but it's it's you know, it's always kind of bubbling in the background as as this potential. Um, and I um, anger kind of frustrates me. I don't like getting angry. Um, I don't like the lack of control that anger brings, um, and I hate the fact that there's this thing there that that kind of takes over. Um, but I think the worst the worst kind of of thing that comes out and and um, I'm not sure I've ever told anybody this bit, but um, sometimes I get angry at her. And that's really, really unfair because she's done nothing wrong. Yeah. But uh, the situation, you know, she'll ask me to do something because she can't do it. And I'm just in that moment where there's so much else going on and so much other pressures and work or whatever. I'll just snap at it and go like, oh, whatever, you know, say something yeah. or, or act in a way. And that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. But in the moment, that's just kind of how how it manifests itself. And that then plays back into the guilt. And then that plays back into the loneliness of, geez, I've got to deal with this on my own. And, you know, and yeah. it all just kind of builds up together. So that's a really um, uh, a fairly uh, uh, unpleasant story, I guess, so far. But um, you know, that's the realities of, of living with and dealing with people yeah. that have long term illnesses. And in my situation with my wife with MS, um, you know, that's just the realities of how it is day to day. Yeah. It is. And, and, you know, and thank you for sharing that. And I, and I really appreciate your honesty and your openness to it. And, you know, I knew this was the conversation you'd be having in this forum, you know, and telling me these things and, and telling people listening as well. It's, you know, and I'm sure loads of people will resonate with those thoughts, you know, the frustration or the anger, you know, I can see it a little bit in some of our situation, you know, with, you know, our story, of course, and, and, and I've shared that with you a lot, but the frustration anger piece in particular tends to be, I don't know if you feel this as well, but directed towards the illness. Yep. It's the illness's fault. You know, the illness is the thing that's stopping you from being able to do the thing that, that you're asking me to do. And, and you become very angry towards that. Is that sort yeah, of fair? A- a- absolutely. Um, uh, 100% um, agree with that. And it's silly things. Now I'll sit there and think, um, geez, you know, 20 years from now, I'm going to be in my mid-60s and my wife will be in her mid-60s and she'll still have MS and she still won't be able to walk and yeah. I'll still have to push around in a wheelchair and will I be able to do that? And that manifests in the, geez, that's on me. And then that manifests in the, but, you know, why am I, I shouldn't be thinking about myself. That's the guilt bit. But the anger bit, absolutely. I think, um, you know, you get angry at the fact that why is this happening to me? Why is, yeah. why is this disease affecting us in the way that it is? Why do we have to put up with it? What have we done wrong to get to this point? Mm. Um yeah, it, absolutely. The anger is is aimed at the disease. It just you know, say sometimes it manifests itself in the wrong way, and that's something you have to work on. But yeah, um, yeah it, you know, um, sometimes it's the only way you can deal with it is to get angry with it and shout at it and try yeah. and you know, get your frustrations out of it. And I guess you know, one of the coping ways is to channel that into um, releasing some of that anguish and that pressure and that that frustration you feel by just getting angry with that that disease and that specific thing in that moment and trying not to let it bleed out into yeah. anger at the wife or anger at the kids or anger yeah. at the dog you know sometimes shout at the dog and she doesn't know what i'm shouting it for but that's um i guess that's part of it <laughs> it still comes back and loves you under- <laughs> that's the <laughs> most important thing you know and yeah. they're not there yeah absolutely, absolutely. It's, you know it is such a it's a, such a fascinating sort of thought so how do you sort of cope with these elements or what do you do mate to you know to, to manage some of these things because loneliness isn't something that we want you know people to be experiencing and and the other elements as well you know guilt and frustration and anger what do you do yeah um and it's i def, definitely don't have all the answers it's not no. a perfect science um i try and do things to um i guess um deal with the feelings in the moment i'm going to get mm-hmm. to that in a minute um, but also then try and structure and build things into my life that longer term not just in the moment help me um and help my wife 
um, think and act in a way where we take the best out of what we have rather than trying to focus on the negatives. So the short term stuff, if I'm if I'm feeling particularly lonely or feeling particularly down, I'll go and spend time intentionally with the people around me. Um, like I said, it's, you know, it's a bizarre feeling to feel lonely in a crowded room, but mm. that crowded room can also start to manifest and, and make you feel like actually, you know, you're not alone. So I will talk to my wife and I'll try and share my feelings with her as much as okay. I can. Yep. It's quite difficult to do, but I'll start to open up and, and chat to her. Um, so I try and force the loneliness back by just being more social, being more engaged and not try and kind of sink into myself. Um, for the guilt, frankly, I just tell myself to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah there's not really I, I i don't know how else to deal with that um you know it's it's um it just is what it is and you just kind of you know, yeah I, I accept why i feel guilty i try and say to myself that it's okay to, to think about yourself and feel um you know, feel that it's tough on you as much as everybody else I, I think that's the hardest one if i'm being honest to kind of self-deal with yeah. um that's the one where i think having people to talk to you about and try and have them understand or have them listen to and, and reflect back to you why you're feeling guilty. Um, because it's a really horrible feeling. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's the one I think that I probably need to work on the most on the anger one. I've just, um, as we've just said, apart from making sure I'm getting angry at the disease and not the people around the disease. Yep. Um, I just take myself away. Um, dog walks. Um, I'll start cycling. Um, which, given them a clutz, is probably a bad idea. I'm sure I'm going to crash at some point. But no, um, positive thinking. <laughs> positive thinking. Positive um, thinking. But yeah, I just try and take myself away and, and do that kind of self meditation and go and yeah. you know, half hour dog walk and do a bit of daydreaming and try and remove my my thoughts from the situation that's making me angry and just reflect on on mm. nothing really. Just kind of clear my mind and, and make me feel better. Um, in the broader sense, kind of how we deal with it all, that's definitely something that I've in the last couple of years tried to do with my wife rather than um, uh, without her. I've tried to include her in that kind of um, process. And that's all about um, feeding off her positivity. As a set start, she is amazing. She's endlessly positive. She's endlessly okay. um, working hard and, and real kind of positive mindset of she will beat this and she will make this better. So feeding off that and feeding off her energy and playing a role in the positive steps that she takes to try and deal with it um yep. you know getting involved in her treatment getting involved in the, the weird remedies that she finds online and gives them a try and you know all that fun stuff and, and sometimes that's just about you know taking the mick out of her and saying well, you're going to take what yep. and then other times it's about getting really engaged and saying i think that's a great idea and being involved in it but but being part of the journey being part of her story i think helps yep. um take it out of this abstract and make it part of who we are um I think also we always really focus on the positives. Um, you know, yes, it's it's rubbish that, that we have to deal with this in, in some ways, um, but equally, there's so many things in our life to be positive around kids, family, yeah. um, you know, jobs, etc. That's that's all positive stuff. So focus on that. Um, the one thing that we constantly do, and it's been really tough in the last year, is always have something to look forward to. Um, you know, it's it's often with with I think generally with mental health, certainly with my mental health, it's the small wins and it's the small things that make a difference. Um, so we've always, you know, whenever we go on holiday, we'll then book another weekend away. It might be six months in the future, but always having that kind of next waypoint of, and we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this is is a great way of kind of keeping focus and keeping that positivity at the front of the mind, um, and that's certainly worked really well for us. So. I say no real answers, but just a sense of you know. That's your that that's things. your way of interpreting them and doing something with it, which is really important, you know. And I'm sure there's lots of other tricks. You once taught me something that I found really useful in in my world, which was, um, and I hope it's all right to say it, but about yeah, an course. anonymous Twitter account. Yes. You know, yep. <laughs> do, you, do you want to? I don't know if you use it still, but you... I, I I do on occasion. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, this is probably going back. Um, uh, Geez, lockdown's kind of mm. elongated time probably two years yeah um i was really struggling about two years ago i was really struggling with some mm. of these feelings that we spoke about today um and i had no outlet for it i didn't really know how to deal with it i hadn't yet got to the point where i felt comfortable talking to my wife more about it I didn't have anybody to open up to so i created a a, a second twitter account anonymous twitter account um mm where you know, I didn't have my name on there, I didn't have anything on there, but but reflected who I was. So to do with it, being husband of, of someone with MS. Yeah. And I just used to write my feelings on there. Um, no one was really following me. There was no, no, I had two or three followers, you know, most of them probably bots. Um, and I wasn't doing it for attention. I wasn't doing it for 
to gain uh, people attention for people to read or follow or anything yep. like that. It was purely a, a release of saying, I've got somewhere I can go and I can just vent. I can just express how I feel yep. unabashed without any um, any restrictions or any fear of upsetting anybody or anything. I can just literally say it. Get it out. And yeah. once it's said, it's done and it's mm -hmm. out and, and then I can deal with it. I can I can move it away. And that, that's really helped. Um, you know, it helped kind of get some of the dark stuff out and mm. maybe I'll go back one day and reread it and see how dark things got and reflect on how great life is, yeah. is you know, has become. So, um, but having that kind of release, I think is, it's, it's, it's really helpful and important. And I, you know, again, just to thank you, cause you put me onto that thought and I use that exact thing as well for something we were going through and just throwing out. And actually it became a really useful resource as well. You know, it was anonymous. Nobody knew who I was, what I was, you know, and I was just, and I was asking the Twitterverse questions and yeah. lo and behold, people never said anything bad, but only gave advice or support, you know, or encouragement. And, and I think that can be really useful, especially when you can't find that place where there is the community to talk openly about that or the group or you know so so it was a really useful resource for me and you know maybe that's something useful for others you know listening if you are struggling and you don't want to talk to somebody or you don't feel that there's a, a you know a place for you a safe space for you to do it throw it out there you know and put it in an anonymous uh, you know box that people would never know it was you and it's always the fear isn't it people are worried about being open about their feelings yeah. and, and and stuff so yeah, yeah absolutely no we're, we're not good at opening up we, we need to get better. Well, we are. <laughs> we, we are, are. yeah. But we, are, but we usually have a hug as well. So, you know, that's the that's the thing we're missing right now. Exactly. It? That and bacon rolls. Hug bacon rolls and, and coffee. And, uh, you know, this, this is like what life's all about. The small stuff makes a big difference, right? Um, Absolutely. Stu, we're getting we're, we're coming to the end of this and believe it or not because these are really Flies quick by. and it does and and you know what with so many other avenues we could have explored but what i think is fascinating is your your sort of the, well the topic in particular of course and it's so you know close to what you're going through and, and understanding and and the way that you see it into those sort of three core areas that you've outlined um so for me thank you for sharing that i really do mean it and i think it's really important that you you've shared that because there will be lots of people that will will resonate with it i know that um any last words from you closing words jerry springer style anything you'd like to impart wisdom um no matter how much you think you are you're not alone there are other people out there um suffering similar problems going through the same challenges mm. it's you know, um it's not always easy to find the answers. It's not always easy to seek out the people to speak to, but but there is help there. And 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 I encourage everybody to get out there and start looking for people to talk to, looking for people to, to kind of understand and, and help them understand their situation. So yeah, yeah I guess that's it. And mate, listen. It's not I very just... Jerry Springer, is it? <laughs> <laughs> be kind and be kind to each other or something like that isn't it <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly uh, and, and you know just just for you mate and and for, for for your family and everybody else i just want to wish you all the very best and thank you for sharing your story and for for where you're at and what's going on and and for joining me at whatever time it is now 10 o'clock or whatever it is um so yeah brilliant mate thank you so much for that really appreciate it if anybody is struggling if you do need extra support or you do want to talk to anybody as i always say at the end of this organizations like Samaritans exist today to have a conversation or a chat in a safe space with somebody that is not there to judge you. They're just there to listen. Um, they don't give advice. They just listen. Um, and it is really useful resource for people. The number is 116123 for anybody that might want to just pick up the phone and have a chat with somebody. Um, you never know, you might even get me one day because I'll be doing shifts at some point again very soon. But Stu, again, thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. I will catch up with you soon, my friend.